For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. Do we need balance? Well, if we think about this physically, at least I take this for granted a lot. I don't go around all the time saying, I need balance, I need balance, I need balance. I just, thankfully, have balance a lot of the time. But it's so very necessary. In our daily life, if I'm just walking around, I take it for granted that I've got balance in order to be able to function well. And if I don't have balance, if I lose balance, then what happens? I fall. I hurt myself. I have all sorts of problems that can develop. Whenever someone suffers from vertigo, that can be really debilitating. You just really can't do much of anything if you've lost balance in that sense. But not only that, sometimes we think about how our health is improved if we have a balanced diet. Now, this might not be the time to be thinking about that having just gotten off of the holidays, but we need to have a balanced diet, and maybe we need to balance our diet with exercise in order to take the best care of our body to stay healthy as opposed to having more problems with sickness and difficulty that way. We see balance as a valuable thing in so many areas of our physical life. Work versus leisure. All work and no play makes Johnny, that's the way I heard it anyway, makes Johnny a dull boy, or that's the way I claimed it to my parents. Right? I don't want to be a dull boy. That would be out of balance of all work and no play. Of course, my dad might want to remind me that all play and no work makes Johnny a spoiled boy or something like that. That would be out of balance in the opposite direction, wouldn't it? And in the world in general, there's a common expression that appeals to a balanced concept of, you know, everything in moderation. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. But there's that sense that we have that something ought to be balanced. Nature itself, if we have all sun and no rainy days, we end up having problems. But if we have all rainy days and no sun, we end up having problems. And if we don't hunt at all, then there can be animal overpopulation sometimes. But if we hunt too much, we can drive an animal population toward extinction. And so just everywhere that we have in our physical lives, there are all sorts of examples where balance is needed and beneficial. What about spiritually? Spiritually, do we need biblical balance? Let me suggest to you that just like in physical lives we need balance, we need balance spiritually in order to stay strong, to be productive, to be functional, the way that God has said, so we won't fall spiritually in order for us to be pleasing and acceptable to God. But just because I suggest some idea doesn't mean it's true. What does mean it's true is whether or not it's what the Bible says. And I want to encourage you to look and see whether or not the Bible really teaches that we need biblical balance. But don't take my word for it, and don't take anybody else's word for some idea that is brought up. What we need to do is make sure that we're searching the Scriptures to see whether or not what is being proposed is true. In Acts 17 and verse 11, there's an example, a good example for us. The Bereans are uh, complimented... Because it says, these were more fair-minded. It would be good for us to be fair-minded, wouldn't it? These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness. Well, are we ready to receive the word? We need to be. But it's not just receiving any old word that comes. 
How did they receive the word? They received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. That's how we need to be receiving the word, is to search the scriptures to see whether whatever anybody is teaching you is actually what the truth of God's word says. And that's what I invite you to do with me tonight. Because what the Bible says is what really matters. Now, I'm going to refer to a number of passages, and I encourage you to follow along and maybe even jot them down so that you'd be able to have further study about these things to search and find out whether it's true. And if you have any concerns or questions, please feel free to ask me afterwards. Uh, Let's have a conversation about this, because that would be very helpful. But let's look at the idea of biblical balance. And let's look at Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. Matthew 23, 23. Jesus is condemning the scribes and Pharisees for what they're doing in uh, in a lot of aspects in chapter 23. But in this one in particular, notice what it says. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Does Jesus stop there? If Jesus had stopped there, it might have validated a popular notion that we see with many people in the religious world today. And sometimes people will say, well, God is love, and what really matters is love. And there would be an emphasis on the weightier matters of love or justice and mercy and faith and those types of things to the dismissal of doing things that would be commanded by God. And if someone were to try to say, well, but God commands this and we need to do this particular command of God, they might end up dismissing it, saying, but, but really the big picture is God is about love and all those details don't really matter. And uh, one of the terms that can be used from time to time would be, um, well, you know, if you get too picky about that detail or this detail or whatnot like that, then uh, you may be legalistic or something along that line. But the question is, does Jesus stop here in the condemnation? Or what instruction does he give? If you look at the rest of the verse... Jesus goes on to say, these, the justice and mercy and faith, the weightier matters of the law, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. That's the biblical balance. That's the balance God calls us to. That's the true balance where we don't get out on one extreme or the other. On one extreme... Like the scribes and Pharisees, we could be neglecting the weightier matters of justice and mercy and faith. That is definitely condemned. But if we throw the baby out with the bathwater, then what we end up doing is we neglect, I guess, what we could call the lesser matters. But we neglect the matters where God calls us to obedience to what His commands are. And so what we've got to do is what Jesus said to do, which is find the biblical balance of doing the justice and mercy and faith and also the details of obeying God as He has said for us to do. That balance is what is pleasing to God. Now, there are some passages that will end up correcting being in the extreme on one side by pointing to and emphasizing the other aspect in order to pull us back toward the balance. And so, whenever we look at 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, 1 Corinthians 13 starts out by saying, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move mount, remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
And though I bestow all my gifts to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And so we end up seeing, if I do all these impressive things that God may end up saying would be good things for me to do, but if I do that, but I don't have the proper motivation, I'm out of balance. And God's not going to be pleased with that. I have to be motivated properly by love to be acceptable to God. But then from another angle... We look at Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, in order to see another aspect that we need to be careful about. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so simply being in a position where we claim that Jesus is our Lord, but not actually doing what God has said to do, isn't going to work for us. That's being out of balance. That is going beyond... What is acceptable to God? And Jesus will reject us if if we're claiming Him as Lord, but not acting as if He actually is Lord by doing what God says we are to do. Now, notice the connection, the biblical balance that Jesus makes that connects love and obedience in the Gospel of John. In John 14 and verse 15, he simply says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 21, he goes on to say, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Going on down to verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. In chapter 15 and verse 10, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So how do we put all of these passages together in order to come to the truth of the biblical balance? Well, we've got to be careful not to be on one extreme. On one extreme, that would be doing things in service to God without a proper heart motivated by love. That's out of bounds. On the other extreme, we could claim Jesus as Lord, but not be doing the Father's will. And that's out of bounds. The biblical balance is that we show respect for Jesus as our Lord by loving Him, by keeping His commandments, which is doing the Father's will. That is the biblical balance that we need to keep. Here's another example of Scripture talking about biblical balance. John 4, in verse 23 and 24. Jesus is talking with the uh, Samaritan woman and says, But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Worship in spirit and truth. Notice the and there. That's very important. It's not or. And so there are two components that need to be balanced in order for us to be doing this the way God says we're supposed to be doing it. How could we get out of balance? Well, one way, one extreme we could do is we could worship in truth, but not in spirit, not having the proper heart, not bringing our spirit into it. 
And just because we go through the motions the way God has prescribed, that's not enough. God wants our hearts, not just, well, we got the truth right. On the flip side, though, we can go to the opposite extreme and we can end up worshiping in spirit and having our heart in something totally dedicated but have missed the truth. And that violates this passage too. Because we are out of balance, not worshiping in spirit and truth. And this passage uses the word must. Those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Let's find that biblical balance instead of losing our balance and falling because we don't do what the Bible says calls us to do. Okay, there is one note of caution that we need to have in mind when we're considering how to be properly balanced. We need to ask, whose definition of balanced? And make sure that we're not following some definition from the world about what would be balanced, but we're actually doing the proper balance. It is not the world's definition of balance. The world might suggest, you know what, it's okay to have a little bit of spirituality. It is okay to have a little bit of that mixed in with other interests. But don't get too serious about it. Wouldn't that be the world's definition of balance? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Everything in moderation, I guess you might say, right? But... If we follow the world's definition of balance, of a little bit of God and then a little bit of worldly pursuits, that's not going to be pleasing to God. What matters is what does the Bible say is the right balance of these priorities. So let's look at what the warning is that we have from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. That's what the world would say to try to do to balance things. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Uh, You cannot serve God and riches, is basically what that means. And the world's balancing act is going to fail. And it's not acceptable to God. In Matthew 13, verse 22, Jesus, in explaining the parable of the sower, one aspect of the parable of the sower, one of the soils that did not work out well was because he said, Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Well, if we try to do the world's balancing act between a little bit of spirituality and a little bit of the world, we're going to be unfruitful and unacceptable to God. Rather, Jesus tells us the balance that we should have back in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. The spiritual priority and then the physical will be taken care of. The Lord promises the spiritual will be... the, the physical, I'm sorry, will be taken care of. That is the balance that He calls for there. The spiritual priority first. So we have to have... God's definition, the biblical definition of balance. And if we look to the Bible in order to give us the proper balance in any and every aspect of life, then we will have what we need. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete... Thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, the question is, do we respect the Bible for being able to do that for us? That the Bible truly does teach us, that's what doctrine means, is profitable for the teaching we need. In what ways? For reproof, for correction, to get us back 
away from the errors that we might be doing, for instruction in righteousness, for helping us to know what is the right thing to do, do we trust that God has given us the Bible, the Scriptures, in order for us to be complete and have everything we need thoroughly equipped for the good work that we should be about doing? If we have that respect for the Bible, then we're in the right place. And our charge then from 1 Peter 4 verse 11 is going to be, if anyone speaks, if we're going to speak, we need to speak as the oracles of God. We need to be doing and saying those things that are actually what God's Word says. And not just the saying of it, but actually doing it from what we saw in Matthew 7. Can't just say, Lord, Lord, but do the will of the Father, right? And so that's what we need to do. Okay, well, let's go to another question to apply this principle. Are religious traditions bad? I I can have my opinion about it. You can have your opinion about it. What really matters is, what does the Bible say about traditions? Well, go to Matthew 15. And at a later point, you may want to look at Matthew 15, verses 1, all the way through verse 14. Uh, for the larger context, but within that context, Jesus condemns something very strongly. In verse 3, Jesus says, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? And in verse 6, He says, Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. And so he concludes later on, verse 9, And in vain they worship me. We talked about true worship before. But this is talking about in vain they worship me. Why? Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Well, are religious traditions bad? It sure sounds like they're bad. But what does Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 15 say? Paul says to the Thessalonians, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Hmm. Well, maybe traditions aren't so bad. But then Colossians 2 and verse 8 says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the word of the world and not according to Christ there's a little bit of a nuance going on here right well what is that are religious traditions bad on one extreme we could end up looking at some of this and would just not really pay that much attention to it and just go ahead and follow whatever traditions man might make up right But that would be getting off and away from the Word of God. Following the traditions of men is not right. So we end up looking at that and we say, well, what that means is we need to not follow any traditions at all. There aren't any traditions. Well, now wait a minute. That's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because what Paul ended up saying was there are biblical traditions that we need to observe and recognize and do but reject the tradition of men. That's the biblical balance. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater on these things. There is a wide range of applications of finding the biblical balance on a whole host of topics. And I'm not going to try to answer every single one of those tonight. Isn't that reassuring? But I want to encourage the beginning of a conversation. Because the Bible, what we need to understand is what does the Bible really say? The biblical balance of what the Bible really says about issues of salvation. You know, there's a lot of division and difference of opinion and views about grace and faith and works and how they all work together and all that kind of stuff. There is a biblical balance to that. 
And I would encourage the conversation to be able to determine and understand what the Bible actually says about how grace and faith and works work together, if I can say it that way. Or what must I do to be saved? Or can one fall from grace or not? Or, let's flip it around, can one feel assured of salvation or not? There's a biblical balance about those things. But not only that, what about the work and the worship of the church? We already looked at the true worship, at worshiping in spirit and in truth. What's the detail of that? To be able to look at that and the work of the church. But not only that, think about different relationships that we have in life. The Bible presents how we should engage those relationships in the proper balance. What's the role of husband and wife? in a properly balanced way. What's the role of parents with children when young and when old? And what is the relationship that we have among spiritual family? There are biblical balance principles to answer that so that we don't get out of balance in one direction or the other. What's our relationship to the world? Should we be totally separate and apart from the world and never engage the world? Or on the flip side, should we be so engaged in the world that we are so heavily influenced by the world that we would become... That gets to be the extreme on the other side. There's a balance on how to relate to the world, on how to relate to authorities. There's a balance. How should we view our work? How should we view our possessions? And a whole host of other things that are questions that are answered in the Scripture in a way that is balanced and defined by Scripture. And we need to ask those questions and determine the biblical truth. So, how can we determine the truth we should follow? How can we find the biblical balance? 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 urges us, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to be diligent to rightly divide the word of truth. That implies what? If we're not diligent, we could wrongly divide the word of truth. And we need to avoid that. So, how can we find the biblical balance? Well, on one extreme, what we could do and mess things up is we could highlight these passages and ignore or dismiss those passages. Or we could be on the opposite end and highlight those passages and ignore and dismiss these passages. But what we have to do is seek the biblical balance by looking at all of the passages and figuring out how those passages work together to harmonize, to give us the truth. That's how we can arrive at the truth. Now, speaking of arriving at the truth, I ask you to think about this for a couple minutes. In a court of law... We're required to give an oath. And part of that oath is very important, which says what? That you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Society has built this framework in order to try to get the judicial system to work. Because the judicial system depends on telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Why is it important that we tell the truth in the judicial system? Well, if there's just a whole bunch of lies floating around, it's going to be hard to determine what's right to do. And the judicial system just breaks down. But why did they keep going beyond just saying, hey, you need to tell the truth? Well, because some people might want to say, well, I did tell the truth. I didn't tell the whole truth. And if I didn't tell the whole truth, what's actually happened is I've deceived about the situation. And the court of law will not come to a beneficial conclusion if they don't have the whole truth to be able to make a good determination, right? Right? So you can't just say, well, you've got to tell the truth because people may withhold what should be said because it's part of the truth. On the other side, though, and nothing but the truth, 
I told the whole truth and I kept talking. And I just said some extra things that were beyond what the whole truth was. What's going to happen to the judicial system when that occurs? Deception is what is occurring there rather than arriving at the truth. And society breaks down. And we recognize society will break down with corruption if they can't figure out a way to elicit the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in order to uphold the good system. Now the thing is, this is not a man-made concept. The Bible calls us to this standard. And just as it's so important for the judicial system not to fall into corruption or being deceived in one direction or the other, it is very important that we deal with the Bible with this respect as well. God said in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32, Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. That's... Seeking the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. We can't add to it. We can't take anything away from it. That's why Paul warns in Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from Him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who would trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And so in that situation, what does he say? But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Notice the any other gospel. Well, which direction is that? That could be to this extreme, or that could be to that extreme. Any direction than the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And those who go beyond in whatever direction, Paul says, let him be accursed. It's very serious. Now look at Peter's warning. 2 Peter 3, verse 14 on down through 18. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent. Look at that diligent concept again. To apply yourself in order to find the truth. Be diligent to be found by Him in peace without spot and blameless. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our, bro- our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles. Speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures. I'm going to pause there for a second just to note. You either have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in the Scriptures, or... The, twist, the, the scriptures have been twisted in some direction. And what does it say? If the scriptures are being twisted in some direction, that's to our destruction. That's a huge warning. So he goes on to say, You therefore, beloved, since you know these things beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, we must be diligent to rightly divide the word of truth. We must beware of twisting the Scriptures. 
So we need to ask ourselves. We need to honestly evaluate and step back and say, wait a minute, do I have itching ears or will I seek the biblical balance? What do I mean by the itching ears? 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 and 4 says that some will end up choosing this path. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Which direction? Either direction. Away from the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But instead of being one who wants to hear what we want to hear, we need to be geared toward seeking what the Bible says is the truth, the biblical balance on the matter. That brings us back to Acts 17 and verse 11. The Bereans were more fair-minded because they were open to receiving the word. How? By searching the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things are so. That's the heart and the attitude that we need to have. To look for the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Now, whenever we search the Scriptures and we're diligent about it and we find out whether it's so, we're going to respond by believing. Therefore, many of them believed May that be a description of us in our attitude. We need to have the biblical balance. We need to seek the biblical balance. We need to do it. We need that truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so that we're pleasing to God, and so that we can help others to find that truth and become pleasing to God as well. Now, as I mentioned before, there's a wide range of applications, and my point here is to open the conversation. And what I would ask you to do is ask some questions about these ideas. Do you have questions about grace, faith, and works? Do you have questions about what must I do to be saved? Do you have questions about whether or not we can fall from grace? Or the relationships that we should have? Or different things like that. What questions does this prompt? And let's start that conversation. Are you interested in opening the Bible together in order to search the Scriptures and find the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the Word of God? Let's start talking about that today. In a moment, we're going to sing a song of invitation. And if you're not a Christian, but you already know the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth of what the Bible says you need to do in response to the gospel call, then we are ready to assist you to be converted to the Lord. But I want you to notice something about the song that we're going to be singing here in a moment. It's called Trust and Obey, number 326. Trust and Obey. Trust and Obey. There's that powerful and again. Both components. It's not one or the other. If you trust, you have the heart in it, but you don't obey, that's not it. If you obey, but without trust, without the heart being in it, that's not it either. And so this song points to the biblical balance of both of those things being together properly. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Jesus. 